This episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association. Want to get discounts on homebrew supplies and save money at craft breweries? Join the American Homebrewers Association and save at more than 2,300 AHA member deal locations worldwide and online. Members enjoy discounts on pints, food, and merch, and 10 to 30% off online orders. My local homebrew shop offers a 10% discount for AHA members, for example. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to check out the AHA member deals in your area and join the AHA. That's homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to join the American Homebrewers Association to access thousands of members-only discounts. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, January 26th, 2023. I'm James Spencer here at Basic Brewing Radio. We're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Colby, author of the Homebrew Recipe Bible and editor of BeerAndGardeningJournal.com, joins me to formulate two recipes for amber lagers, one on the more traditional side and another with an American twist. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And many thanks to everybody who is helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Financial supporters this week will see an early release of our video episode on Steve's and my winter ales. Both are dark and delicious. Both use spices and flavorings, which will reign supreme. Financial supporters will get the recipes, along with a behind-the-scenes video of me brewing my beer as well. I'm looking out my window this morning at about half a foot of snow. Wet, heavy, gloppy stuff. It's supposed to melt fairly quickly, though. People around here, they don't understand physics sometimes. They have, <laughs> they have some problems driving in the snow. You know, some some tend to think that four-wheel drive makes you immune to uh, finding your way into the ditch. But uh, luckily, with this winter storm, we didn't get a layer of ice under the snow. So it could have been worse. A day before the snow hit, it was gorgeous outside. So I brewed the, the first beer that Chris and I talk about in a couple of minutes, or at least a version of it. More details later. Uh, I brewed No Chill, as I planned, and cooled the wort in my basement for uh, before uh, pitching the next day. Again, more details on that later, including how I had to modify the grain bill a bit. It's going to be good, though. I brewed that beer on my Warthog Electric Brew in a Bag system from our friends and sponsors Desiree and Dave from HighGravityBrew.com. You know, I have the 240-volt uh, version, so heating up 8 gallons or 30 liters of water didn't take very long at all. And even though it was chilly outside, my mash was held rock steady at 150 degrees Fahrenheit or 65 C for 90 minutes. And I hit my target gravity. Uh, after I took out the bag, I cranked the Blickman boil coil up to 85% while I washed the basket and other stuff and and when it got up to a boil, the wort was jumping around so much, I backed it off to like 70% power. Now, you can configure your own, your own uh, Warthog electric system at highgravitybrew.com, including upgrading your system to Spike or Blickman kettles. Uh, whether you go brew in a bag like me, I want to step up to a two- or three-vessel system. Dave will build the setup that's perfect for you in the back of High Gravity there in Tulsa. Check out all the shiny new electric Warthog gear at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com and use the code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your Warthog purchase. That's at HighGravityBrew.com. Okay, let's talk to Chris about Amber Loggers. Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on the show. Happy 2023. Mm-hmm. Crazy. <laughs> How, anyway, last time we got together, uh, we talked about a, what is it, a raspberry wheat beer? We formulated a mm-hmm. recipe, and you, and, and you were going to brew that. How's it going? It's going very slowly. The, uh, <laughs> the ingredients are still at the homebrew shop. That's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Well, you've got a situation where you had a local homebrew shop and then you don't now. So I I suggested that uh, that you order from a certain HighGravityBrew.com website. 
yeah, I'll order some stuff from them and make my make myself a wheat beer. Yeah, yeah. So I can so I can taste it. I'm thirsty. I just ne- need me a wheat beer. I just had some live oak Hefeweizen as I watched the Vikings <laughs> their uh, season down their pain leg. <laughs> Vikings. <laughs> Starting off swearing. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to edit. <laughs> Put some funny sound effects mm-hmm. in there. <laughs> uh, well, there you go. So so we're going to talk. I asked you. I've got these. Uh, speaking of sponsors of the show, I got these two packets of uh, Imperial Huga. Uh, that I need to uh, to put to work, and I got some empt- you know a couple of empty uh, kegs, uh, and I got an empty kegerator, so I can use that to uh, to actually do a, a controlled lager fermentation at with traditional lager temperatures. Nice. So I said, I, I said, well, what lager uh, should we should we put together that for me to brew? And what what did you say? I suggested an amber lager. And we, uh, Matt Giovanisi, uh, earlier in the series, the recipe development series, did an amber ale. Mm-hmm. So it'll be interesting to see how, you know, how you guys' approach uh, differs and is similar to brew uh, sort of similar beers. Is is an amber lager similar to an amber ale? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you can – amber lagers cover a fairly large range and, uh, and amber ales – even even more so, and there's there's a lot of overlap in there. The the uh, amber ale that uh, Matt brewed was was delicious and hoppy. Uh, it was just kind of like a it was kind of like a darker uh, you know American pale ale essentially. Um, I'm take I'm taking it with this style, or at least the, what I've got in my head. I don't want to go you know super super hoppy with this with this amber lager. Uh, and it seems like that might be, you know, sort of a more traditional tact. Yeah, compared to an amber ale, uh, an amber lager is going to be a little bit drier, uh, uh, a little less hop forward, especially the uh, um, any flavor or aroma uh, hops are going to be dialed back. And so, yeah, there, there's going to be some differences there. And, and, you know, the big difference, of course, is that, you know, the, the different yeast uh, – the lager yeast is going to make uh, a beer with less of, of, you know, less esters or fewer esters. Or would it be less esters? Fewer. Fewer. Because <laughs> we're counting each individual molecule. That's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So fewer esters and, uh, you know, uh, l- less of a yeast, uh, less of a yeast presence and generally also less hop aroma. Yeah, the, the focus on amber lagers is generally on the, the good ones. It's, it's it's they're very well balanced beers, and you just you know, yeah, you taste them and you go, yeah, that's a good beer. Let less hop aroma, fewer cans of hop aroma. That's the mm-hmm. <laughs> that's the trick we used to use in broadcast journalism, uh, grammar for journalist class. Except it was soup. Uh, <laughs> less soup, fewer cans of soup. Uh, so I I've got to the. I, I looked up in the uh, BJCP uh, app uh, for uh, one of the styles you you suggested was Vienna Lager, and uh, the comments on the Vienna Lager were a standard strength everyday beer, not a beer brewed for festivals. American versions can be a bit stronger, drier, and more bitter, while modern European versions tend to be sweeter. Many Mexican amber and dark lagers used to be more authentic but unfortunately are now more like sweet, adjunct-laden, amber-slash-dark international lagers. Uh, Regrettably, many modern examples use adjuncts which lessen the rich malt complexity characteristic of the best examples of the style. Um, So I'm taking... uh, That that sounds like adjuncts, at least according to the BJCP. Uh, Adjuncts, when when you're in this neighborhood, are frowned upon. And if the BJCP says it, it has to be true because <laughs> they know everything about beer, I which just... is why they change their recommendations every four years. <laughs> I just I just read oh. that just to get your hackles up. I know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so if we will, I've got my copy of the uh, the homebrew recipe Bible uh, uh, written by a certain Dr. Chris Colby. 
Uh, if you'll turn in your in your homebrew recipe Bibles to page one sixty two, uh, we have the uh, is it Wiener Wiener Blut Lager, yeah, and then and one sixty we have the Movie Night Lager. Uh, now compare and contrast. You know, tell us about these two beers. Uh, the Movie Night Lager is pretty much a straight up, uh, I would say, sort of American interpretation of the style. It's uh, slightly sweet. Um, uh, mild, you know, only mildly hoppy. Uh, it's got a little bit of sort of caramel flavor and, and a little bit more body, uh, to it. Not, although not, it's not super full bodied. And the, uh, the Wiener Blut is, uh, a little drier. Uh, there's, there's no caramel in it or, well, there's a tiny amount of Carafa special, but that's a roast. And yeah, it is just a little bit drier, uh, beer both of them are, are right around five percent abv i'm i'm leaning toward the uh the is it wiener wiener blute uh yeah, vienna wiener lager blute. rather than the the more americanized amber lager uh just because you know it's 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 winter time i'm kind of leaning towards something you know in the more lighter crisper uh I guess ironically, I guess <laughs> normal norm, yeah. normal people would want darker, <laughs> sweeter, heavier beers in the winter. Uh, but uh, but I, you know, I just, I'm just in the mood for something you know lighter and and more drinkable. Uh, so we could use these as 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 templates, or we could just you know like brew these out of the book and be done with the show. But that's no fun. <laughs> <laughs> we can't quit like seven minutes and forty four seconds into the show. <laughs> uh, into the interview, at least. Uh, so let's let's take the 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 approach that we generally do on the um, on the recipe development series. I assume you got your you got your spreadsheet uh, handy. Mm-hmm. And uh, so what the the I was surprised that even in your your Vienna Lager that you went with. Oh no, I'm sorry. You did. It was the the American Amber Lager. You went with two row, uh, mm-hmm. which would which would make sense for an American version, right? Uh, in the Vienna Lager, you went with the German Vienna malt as the as the you know taking the the yeah, lion's the... share of the of the base malt. So so what what approach you know in these in these you know amber lagers these more traditional amber lagers. What are we looking for in our base malts? Well, you've got you've got a variety of, of options that you can do. Uh, you can use Pilsner malt for you know a fairly large percentage. You can use Vienna malt. You can use Munich malt, or you can use a blend of all three, or or just two of them. You really have a lot of uh, options. Um, you know, uh, so for a for fairly dark beer. Uh, you know, within the range of amber lagers, uh, a mix of Vienna malt and a little bit of like light Munich or, or even a little bit of dark Munich together, uh, you know, with a original gravity around uh, 12 to 14 Plato, which would be 1048 to 1056. And, you know, yielding a beer of five to six percent ABV, something like that's a good base for your malts. Um, you can do a Pilsner with like uh, Pilsner or pale malt with, with some crystal, you know, uh, crystal malts, caramel malts, or like a, you know, Cara, Cara this, Cara that, uh, <laughs> in the, you know, in the 30 to 90 love of bond range, um, as another option. But I sort of like using the, the darker base malts, uh, you know, uh, healthy amounts of Munich and healthy amounts of Vienna is a good start for these beers. Yeah. I, I, I like that idea. I like the, you know, kind of, crisp and, and clean. Um, we did a, an experiment on our, uh, Steve and I, with uh, our malt sampler series. And it might have been, I know we did a show where we, we <clears throat> did a beer with 100% 10 Love a Bond Munich, and then another beer with 100% 20 Love a Bond Munich. Hmm. Yep. Both were drink were drinkable. But I preferred the lighter one. The that much, you know, 100 percent of the 20 Love of Bon Munich was just a bit too sweet for me. You know, it fermented fine, it converted just fine, but it just was just you know way 
way too sweet for me. Um, so I would, I would think in my mind, if we were going to use like a darker Munich malt, um, for part of this malt bill, I would, I would be fairly constrained, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, for something like this, making Vienna malt, the, uh, the predominant one, and then just rounding it out with uh, either either Munich Light or Munich Dark is a, is a good way to go. So uh, how so how much? I mean, Vienna Malt. I, usually, in all grain beers, for you know, in my system, if I use ten pounds of a base malt, uh, it gets me around ten fifty starting yeah. starting gravity, or ten pounds could... or four point five kilograms. Yeah. And we could do, we could say 10 pounds total, and if we wanted to, we could say like uh, 75% of that is, is Vienna malt, so 7.5 pounds, and then that uh, would leave, what, two, where's Munich malt on my spreadsheet? There it is, 2.5 pounds of Munich, yeah, and that would give us, yeah, uh, 1052 uh Starting gravity and uh, where's the color? Yeah, SRM of about ten. Sounds good. Is that dark? Be, is that dark it enough? Be, it should be darker. And we could fix that in a couple different ways. One would be to add a, a fairly small amount of a, of a dark caramel malt, um, but that's going to raise the uh, or that's going to lower the ferment. Fen- fermentability and raise the sort of mouthfeel. So I, I think another thing would be or a good option would be to take like something like black malt or dehusked black malt. Even mm. there's a, you know, Wireman has that carafe special ones that are dehusked and just add like a couple ounces is all you need. And that shifts the color to uh, a slightly darker hue, but it doesn't add any, you know, just two ounces. It's you know, it's not going to taste like a stout or anything, right? Um, especially with the with the dehusked. And yeah, the black prins is a is a is a tasty product um, <clears throat> that goes along those lines. Very very yeah. very very dark, uh, dehusked, I believe. <clears throat> so lots of color, not a whole lot of flavor. Um, it seems like we we in our malt sampler series we like that one quite a bit. Hmm. Should we? It is said, uh, and it's a trick that I think Charlie Papazian uh, uses, uh, is to mimic uh, decoction. Uh, you add a, l- a bit of uh, melanoidin malt. You can if you want. Um, it's yeah, melanoidin or uh, what's the other word they call it? Aromatic malts. Those, yeah. those tend to be similar. Yeah, and you can think of those as just sort of like super Munich. You know, they are uh, <laughs> um, uber Munich. <laughs> yeah. And you know you can add them. the The more you add, though, the more they're going to get towards that you know dark Munich character that you didn't like. Mm-hmm. So mm. um, I don't know. In this beer, I would I would skip them. Okay. In part, just because, uh, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm also like these days. I, I when I when I think of recipes, I mean, I used to think this was a while ago. A lot of terms of like, oh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Now I'm trying to I think more. In terms of like, how can we simplify this, you know, and something like it, if you get a good quality Vienna malt and a good quality Munich malt together, you don't really need to accentuate it with much. They're going to be uh, it's going to be good, you know, if not great. And uh, I'm assuming I'm assuming hops again are, are not going to be the uh, the star of the show here. No, in a beer like this. It should have a, a a relatively firm bitterness. It's like you know, it's not going to lack uh, the hot bitterness of a typical like American Pilsner or anything. It's there's it's definitely going to be, but it's going to be mostly hot bitterness, and the uh, the aroma and and flavor is is going to be either you know the the, the late additions are either going to be zero or very uh, very toned down. Mm. And generally, you know, uh, some some sort of neutral. Uh, hops, and you can use, uh, you know, the the usual 
suspects, you know, Haller Tower, Tetnanger, or that. Or you can use um, uh, something higher uh, in in percent alpha hop acids like Magnum. You know, mm. that's a fairly um, neutral hop, and you don't really need, you know, and then obviously it becomes more neutral when you because you're not adding that much of it. So yeah, you can add, uh, you know, either quite a bit of lower uh, alpha acid hops, or you can add a small amount of something that's got, you know, uh, got a, got a fairly high percentage of alpha acids. I, I, I like Czech saws or sots, as I've said on the show. Okay. Uh, and the last batch I got from the homebrew shop uh, weighed in at three point two percent alpha acid. Um, and I like the I like the idea of not not uh, putting any late hops in this beer because then I can do a no chill <laughs> huh. and not have to worry about you know preserving you know hop character. Uh, I could just you know uh, rack the wort into my no chill container and put it in the basement, and then you know the next morning rack it to a fermenter and and then pitch the the yeast and uh, put it in the uh, kegerator. Yeah, and if you added. At 3.2% alpha acids, if you added two and a half ounces, that brings you right about to 30, which is which is a pretty good amount of uh, bitterness. That, that should balance nicely, nicely with the malt. That's you know a little bit lower than your average pale ale or whatever in, in terms of just bitterness, which is or or uh, you know sort of a, that's about as bitter as like Bitburger if you know that Pilsner beer. Hmm. Uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, that's it. that's an easy one. Uh, so what's a, what's our what is, what are the final predicted numbers? R- I've got uh, ten fifty three as uh, so OG, ten thirteen would be the final gravity, but that de- that depends on our uh, attenuation, which which could be a little bit higher, um, depending on how we how we handle the mash and everything. Uh, then I've got thirty IBUs. Uh, 18 SRM, uh, 5.1 for the uh, for the ABV, and five gallons of beer for the volume. And Imperial uh, Huga uh, for the uh, for the yeast. Um, mm-hmm. And and I'm not going to make a starter. Um, I usually make starters for lagers, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the. Uh, I've used uh, you know Imperial before, just using a fresh pouch. Uh, mm-hmm. In a similar beer, you know, at lager temperature, and it was fine. So, does it give the the cell count? Two hundred billion cells. Two hundred billion. <laughs> billion, as Carl Sagan would say, two hundred billion cells of cosmic stardust. Hmm. You're made of star stuff. Uh, so yeah, I'm, that seems like an easy beer. I like easy. Yeah, the uh, I mean the nice thing about an amber lager is that if you pick good, uh, good quality base malts, yeah, you don't need this incredibly long, you know, list of uh, of malts to to make a good beer. And then of course, if you're going with with a single uh, addition for bitterness, which is, you know, uh, like a lot of them, those do, uh, then you know your your entire recipe is very simple. I mean, you have options, though. You can, again, you can do, you know, you can add crystal or caramels, uh, up, you know, anywhere from zero to ten percent, and that'll give some sweetness. Uh, you can do like we did, add a tiny bit of roasted malt, especially black malt or, or a dehusked black malt, because those have no, uh, basically no aroma and, and very little flavor, uh, but but they're dark enough that they will change the the hue of the beer. And then, you know, you can add, uh, you know, as you said, melanoid, and that's a possibility. You could also add, I mean, some amber lagers, not usually not the ones that try to be like continental Vienna lagers, but some of them add like a little bit of biscuit or victory malt for that, you know, the biscuit malt flavor. Uh, yeah, I'd, I would avoid that, but that's just a personal thing. So, yeah, simple, simple malt bill. So what about um, our mashing strategy? Uh, is a single infusion mash just fine for this kind of a thing? 
Yeah, I mean, the thing about malts these days is they're malted with the intention that they'll, they'll be used in a single infusion mash. Mm -hmm. So they've, you know, they've, the, the proteins have been modified to the degree that, you know, and everything else has been mo modified to the degree that it'll work well in, uh, in a simple infusion mash. And to, to get any mash to work well, uh, you should have probably maybe 50 to 100 parts per million calcium in your water. That you know, just calcium is just good and <laughs> across the board. Uh, so of course, and you might want to, it, you know, you might want to bump up the amount of carbonates in your beer slightly. You know, generally under under 50 parts per million is what you use for a, for a pale beer. Uh, so in a in an amber lager, you know, maybe between 80 and 100 parts per million. Uh, calcium or, or i'm sorry carbonate you know uh, then single infusion mash and that should work really well if you wanted to make a slightly drier beer uh you could do a step mash either a step infusion or one where you directly heat it and you know start off with a rest at like 140 degrees and you can rest there anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours and you know the the longer it is the the, the returns diminish you know 15 minutes is going to dry out the beer a little bit, but two hours isn't going to dry it out, you know, whatever, six times more. Mm. It's just going to be, you know, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, and anyway, so like I just a rest at 140 is going to, to dry the beer out a little bit. And I would avoid um, doing a step mash where you, you, you mash in like low enough that you're in the, what, what they used to call a protein rest range. Mm -hmm. um, like, like I said, the, the malts are, are, you know, the proteins have been modified during malting to the, the degree that they should be or, or, you know, the degree that most brewers would want them to be. Um, and so modifying them further with a with a protein rest, you run the run the uh, risk of having a headless beer. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> or, or or at least diminishing the, the 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 foam, you know, it's appropriate for Halloween. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then for this style of beer, the last thing I'd say about mashing is a lot of people, especially young brewers, when they first read about decoction mashing, are like, ooh, I want to be all traditional and do a decoction mash. And, you know, that's great if you can get your hands on uh, under-modified Pilsner malt. Um, but if you if you bought ordinary Pilsner malt or any Vienna or Munich, I, I'm not aware of any under-modified versions of those malts on the market. You know, you uh, if you do a decoction mash with just normal malts, you're... Yeah. You're not. You're just wasting your time. You're not really going to get the the flavor is going to be a little bit different, but you're you're probably going to screw up the proteins, <laughs> and uh, and just waste a lot of time. And I I would I would uh, advise if you're going to do your first decoction, do it on a smaller batch, maybe like a two gallon batch, because <laughs> it takes a lot of time, you know, to heat up all those different things all those different times and. To get your process down and and uh, you know if you really want to play with it, start start small first and then then move up to the larger volumes. In my opinion, so yeah, and also be good about stirring. Yeah, I don't yeah. I, I got a little cavalier on one decoction mash I did, and you know, I'll stir it every once in a while. Whoops. <laughs> so. Why is the Un bottom unwanted, crunchy? <laughs> unwanted rauch beer, yeah, <laughs> except not in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people would say un un unwanted Ralk beer is just Ralk beer. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like a smoked beer, but, you know. Okay, there was a bit of a snag when I went to brew my Vienna lager. Uh, the local homebrew shop was, was low on Vienna malt. So instead of seven and a half pounds of Vienna, I wound up with three and a half pounds of Vienna. And I... I substituted four pounds of crisp Maris Otter for the rest. I know it doesn't fit with the style, but I think it'll be uh, delicious. Uh, the wort tasted good anyway. I chilled it overnight, racked to a carboy, and pitched a packet of Imperial L25 Huga with no starter into the 1050 wort. And I put it into my kegerator at around 57 degrees Fahrenheit or 14 C. And before bedtime, I did see the airlock bubble a couple of times. But this morning, the day after pitching, the beer was very happy and fermentation was, was pretty vigorous. So my stir plate remains dusty because I don't use it anymore to make starters for moderate gravity five-gallon batches with imperial organic yeast, even lagers. 
Those 200 billion cells in each easy-to-open package get to work in a hurry. I'm really looking forward to tasting this beer. Ask your local homebrew shop about L25 Huga from Imperial Organic Yeast and check them out at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. So if we were going to uh, so and and we should say that with you're going you're planning to put these recipes that we come up with on your blog beerandgardeningjournal.com. Mhm. Uh so let's give them a twofer. I mean if we were to go, you know, kind of americanize this recipe uh for a second recipe. I'm going to brew the first one. But if we were going to do like an american amber lager, you know, what tweaks would you put on it? What how would you change this recipe? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably just start with uh, – you could start with either Pilsner or Pale Malt. Uh, but then instead of getting the color from Vienna and Munich and, and you know, a little bit of a – little bit of roasted malt, I'd probably add, you know, uh, some like Crystal Malt or Cara, you know, whatever uh, in the in the 40 Love of Bond range. And then I'd add uh, like maybe half again that much uh, in, in the – of that – of a Cara Malt in like the 60 – Mm. Love a bond range, a blend of the. I, for some reason, I, I've I've used that sort of blend a, a few times, and I don't know. I would dial that up to about maybe uh, three quarters of a pound for a five gallon batch, mm. somewhere in there. So you know, it'd be a little less than you'd use in in a pale ale, uh, but a little darker blend. Yeah, that that would make for a slightly uh, less fermentable beer, and then likewise, I would probably do. Like if I if I did a, a step mash, uh, for the for the for the other one, the first one, you know, I'd probably do a really quick version, like mash in at 140, let it sit for 50 minutes, and then just turn on the heat and start stirring it, and you know, bring it up to like 152 and, and rest it for another 30 minutes. Uh, you know, you're gonna you're gonna be uh, all all the conversion's gonna be done pretty quickly. Um, but for the, the more, uh, the American version with the amber lager with a little bit more sweetness, or at least what I think of as, as an American version, uh, do a single infusion mash at a, at a slightly higher temperature, like maybe 154, mm. something like that. Um, and then, and then make sure to mash out and make sure to keep the sparge water hot so that the, uh, the grain bed stays right around, you know, 168 to 170, Fahrenheit while you run off the mash and then also make sure to you know turn on the heat to the kettle so when you're you start heating things immediately just so that because if any of that drops below you know uh into the mashing range again then it you know it'll start to mash again because mm. all your uh or at least a considerable amount of enzymes have probably uh survived until that point that's a good point and in this movie night lager, this American amber lager, uh, you put a couple ounces of uh, black malt as well. Uh, I'm assuming that's just for color. Yeah, just for color. In hops, it's American beer. <laughs> We're not afraid of yeah, hops. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go for something, you know, any of the newer varieties that are, are fairly neutral. Um, uh, like an old time favorite of mine would be Willamette. You know, that's a solid hop. And you could, you know, for something like that, you could even, like I, I know in the one in the homebrew Bible, I added a li little bit of Liberty hops, a half ounce at the end. Um, and that, that would give it a little more hop aroma. And, and you know, Liberty was, uh, or is, uh, you know, an interesting, interesting, but not completely, uh, it's, its varietal character isn't like completely aggressive, but it, it's it's got a decent varietal character. Mm. Or any, you know, there's there's all the all the new varieties out there too. Um, I probably in an amber lager, I probably would avoid the 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 super tropical fruity, you know, ones or all like that. But uh, you know, something a, a small amount of something with a with a mild varietal character, I think would work well. And you in the recipe, you suggested adding it ten minutes before the end of the boil and no dry hopping. So again, right. you're not overpowering the beer with with hops, but it should should have a nice, uh, nice little hop character to go along uh, with the kind of sweetness of the of the beer as well. Yeah, that sounds delicious too. 
<laughs> you know, Steve's got the third pack of the Huga. Uh, so, you know, maybe when you put these recipes out there on uh, on beerandgardeningjournal.com, I'll, I'll send him over to the page and see what he thinks about that. Of course, Steve's Steve always – he's it's hard for him to leave a recipe alone. He always puts mm, his own yeah. spin on it, you know, which is a good thing. Uh, if you yeah, know what, if too. you know what you're I, doing, <laughs> yeah, I even my own recipes when I brew them, I uh, a lot of times just will say, you know what, I'm going to do something solid for this time, and and it's good because if you if you take notes, you learn, mm-hmm. you know, and I think this this would be a good beer uh, if if homebrewers hadn't brewed a lager before something like a you know lager like this, it's average. Uh, you know, like average strength, you're not dealing with, you know, uh, making a, a double bock as your first lager or, mm. or something like that where the, the fermentation is more stressed. Uh, you could really learn a lot about lager brewing. And, you know, the big things, of course, are you need to pitch more yeast compared to an ale. Um, and I would, back in the day, I don't know if you remember all this, but there was all these, everyone had a different version of brewing a lager like some people would pitch uh pitch the starter that's relatively warm into the beer that was like at ale temperatures and then cool it down once it got going Mm -hmm. and other people would say no no you gotta make it even colder than your fermentation temperature and then pitch you know the, the cold yeast slurry into that and you know um so there's there's different ways that people have done that i i think you know pitching storing your yeast starter at the temperature that you're going to be fermenting at and um, uh, pitching in into wort that's cooled to the temperature that you're going to be fermenting at or, or even just a, a degree or two below is the way to go. Um, although you can, as a, as a twist, you can raise your yeast in your yeast starter at sort of ale temperatures. And then you'll just, what you want to do is cool it down to, to the temperature that you want and pour off all the beer and right. just pitch the just pitch the slurry part. Right. Because for a for a five gallon batch, you're you're pitching between like three and four quarts, you know, uh, you know three quarters to one gallon into a five gallon batch. So, if all that tastes like ale, that's gonna throw right. off your fermentation product. But if you if you if it's just a slurry, you know, there, there's a tiny amount of beer mixed in with the uh, with the yeast, but but not enough really to to cause some harm. And if you're using, say, a, a you know a light malt extract to make your starter, you know, adding, you know, shoot, if you're adding like three or four uh, quarts or like a gallon of, <laughs> of, yeah. of uh, you know, if you're adding 20 percent of your volume of beer is, is another, you know, is a lighter color uh, wort or whatever, uh, or I guess it's beer at that point. Yeah. Um, I also start my uh, my lagers. Uh, you know, from 55 to 60 uh, mm-hmm. Fahrenheit, you know. So what is that? Uh, uh, about, f- what, 15 degrees Celsius, you know, which is a l- maybe a little warmer than what people are comfortable with. But, uh, you know, for the sticklers. But, but you know, you don't need stress in your life. <laughs> And just a few degrees is not going to be that much of a difference. In fact, the you know the brulosophy experiments on loggers suggest you know that at least in some you know lager yeasts, um, you know the temperature you know even fermenting at ale temperature is not going to make that much of a difference. You know if at all. Uh, so you know I think loggers. When I first started doing loggers, it just scared the crap out of me because I. Th- <laughs> I thought, oh, my God, you know, it's going to just like all grain brewing. It's going to be so hard. I'll never be able to do it. But just cut yourself some slack and, you know, give, give yourself – It's home brewing, unless you like being stressed, is not about being stressed. You know, don't be such a stickler on, on keeping, you know, the temperatures as low as you can get them or whatever. Um, just – you know, relax. Uh, don't worry. Have a home brew and, and ferment a little uh, warmer. That's me, anyway. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I th- I think it's more important when you're brewing a lager to have a consistent temperature. You know, if you can hold it at one temperature throughout the entire fermentation, uh, you're better off doing that, even if it's a little higher than you know uh, uh, what what 
you know whatever source you're using recommends. If you start out and and you you know you're running a little hot because fermentations you know generate their own heat, you know, and so you, let's say you start out and you're fermenting at like 58 degrees, and then as time goes down, it you know you uh, dial that down to 52 degrees or whatever. I think you'd be better if you could just do something a little extra to hold it, say start at 56 degrees and just have it be at that mm. same temperature across the whole thing. And we can't we can't forget the uh, diacetyl rest um, because, you know, that's that to me is more important than, you know, the the keeping a low temperature is, is making if you are keeping a low temperature, you need to make sure that while the yeast is still active in the fermentation at the at the end, you need to warm that uh, wort up. And, you know, get, make sure that the yeast has enough activity uh, to get rid of those buttery, you know, butterscotchy um, diacetyl characters. Because a yeast or a lager yeast fermentation, you know, it some of them stink and you shouldn't be scared of that, first of all. But, you know, that's, you know, like uh, better out than in, you know, as Shrek would say. Uh, you know that that's kicking those nasty uh, flavors out of the airlock instead of keep keeping them in the beer, and you need to make sure that your you your yeast is warm enough at the end of the fermentation to clean the beer up, uh, right? Yes, you you definitely can do that. You can also, uh, although this is sort of more of an advanced technique, you can use croisoning to do that. Mm. You can make a second, a smaller starter of beer, like maybe half a quart. Uh, or actually I'd have to go look up what, what the best ratio is, but you know, it's not much, but you, you, when the, when the primary batch has finished its fermentation, you, uh, add a small amount of strongly fermenting beer to it. And, and, and you, you can also additionally, although you, you don't need to cause they're, they're croisoning, but you, you let that, that fresh yeast get in there and clean up all the, uh, all the diacetyl. And that's, that's, a, a another option. A slightly more, you know, uh, labor intensive option than doing than doing a diacetyl rest. Mm -hmm. And then the only other thing I would say is that like, uh, like in the very early years, and probably this is probably so far gone, nobody. <laughs> it's just only for like people as old as I am. But it seems to me a lot of recipes gave lagering times that were just like ludicrously long. Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't need that if you if you have a good, uh, you know, if you have a good way to reduce diacetyl, uh, and the the VDKs as they would say, um, then uh, just a, a reasonably short time, like you know, like four weeks at uh, you know, sort of refrigerator temperature, or a, like a little lower if you can manage it, uh, it should be fine, and then. Also, uh, you can also just sample the beer and see if it's, yeah. you know, um, for one thing, you can, uh, after the, after the, uh, what am I thinking of? After the diacetyl rest, <laughs> you can, you can rack the beer to a keg, you know, and, and have it, you know, started to be pressurized and stuff and, and then just, you know, sample it a little bit after, after a month and see like, does it taste like it's ready? If so, it's ready. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I remember I used to see ads or not ads, uh, but, uh, recommendations to, you know, it's like lager for three months and it's like, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> beers for drinking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I don't, you know, after the, for the first month and a half, I don't know what they think what's going to be happening, but <laughs> I'm going to be sampling every day. Oh, it's, I can't tell if it's any better, but boy, it tastes, Oh, Hey, it's just about, yeah. Oh no, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. I've had that happen. <laughs> hey, it's just perfectly. Uh, and then... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get, <laughs> I get to edit out into the swear word. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, you, I usually use a little bicycle horn to to to, uh, mm -hmm. to boop, boop. yeah. If he, he, let me know if you have a, another favorite sound effect that you want to use instead of that for your uh, for your swear words. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, what else? Uh, we say, we say, we we talked about homebrew recipe Bible is your book also uh, methods of modern homebrewing, and the uh, how to make hard seltzer. Are people yeah. still making hard seltzer? That's a the thing. other one. And uh, and beer and gardening journal dot com. Mm-hmm. And uh, and your 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 you can read about your your poisonous garden. <laughs> yeah, it's going good. <laughs> All right. I've got I've got some plants that I need to start thinking about what to do with though cuz it's like <laughs> they're not just poisonous, they're they're a contact hazard. So, that's awesome. You can be gardening and just touch something and then suddenly your hand goes numb. <laughs> it's like the year I planted okra and mm-hmm. uh cucumbers and squash uh at the same time. And uh yeah, I was always itching and scratching uh, because those are prickly. Uh, plants and don't don't plant your rows of okra too close together if you're going to walk amongst them to to pick the okra. Hmm. Uh, it's they're prick it's prickly. I tell you, <laughs> I did not know that. Did not know that. I did not know that. <laughs> Doc is here. Doc is not here. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, well, uh, we will uh, we'll talk to you. Hopefully, I will have a beer to send you next time we talk. Oh dear, and vice versa. Yeah, no Pretty pressure. Close to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, a little pressure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like to I like to plan things <laughs> <laughs> and then procrastinate. <laughs> plan your work and work your plan. <laughs> All right, Chris Colby. We'll talk to you next time. Nice talking to you, James. Well, thanks again to Chris. Don't forget to look for the recipes on beerandgardeningjournal.com. Next week, another lager with Matt Giovannisi of Brew Cabin. Looking forward to brewing that one as well. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. Please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.